I'm sure I'm not the first person ever to make this comparison. But Classic Sonic's return to the fold over the past decade has felt akin to an aging pop star trying to reclaim their fame. Yeah, he's done a couple of collaborative ventures with his modern counterpart, and yeah, his solo comeback album, Sonic Mania, proved that yeah, he's still got it, even though it was, for the most part, covers of his greatest hits with a few new ditties sprinkled in there. But who knew what the future held for him? Well, five years later, we got an answer. Another album of just the greatest hits. Wait, can we say this now? Can, can we now say this? <gasps> Sonic had a rough transition back to 2D. Ha! See how it feels? You see how it feels? Except we might exercise a little restraint in using that term in the future. It's a one and done. Ah, 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 stop right there, old chap. You seem to be enjoying this video. You know what that means? You owe it to me to subscribe. Okay, no you don't, but like, I, I would love it if you did. But if you've already done that, help a brother out, hit the like button, and in the description below, you can join my cult by making a monthly pledge on Patreon, which goes towards making content like this. I couldn't do it without you guys. Getting back on track though, yeah, it definitely comes across that at Sega there is a very apparent reluctance to really do anything new with Classic Sonic, in spite of his big comeback. In a recent interview regarding Sonic Frontiers, Takeshi izuka san did make it quite clear that Classic Sonic is indeed a part of the Sonic business model going forward to appeal to a much wider amount of Sonic fans. And this has been kind of a business model they've been trying to make work since even before Sonic Mania, we had of course Sonic the Hedgehog 4. And even in that game, it was apparent that there was a certain mold that they were trying to fit the 2D Sonic into. Kind of something to play it very safe for the fans of the originals. And the problem with that is, diehard fans of the originals have already played the originals. They don't need imitation brand versions of the originals. The key with any mascot platformer is when moving it forward, you need to basically keep what people loved about the original, things like the gameplay style, but put it in new worlds with new stories and new styles. And when it comes to classic Sonic, you will be hard pressed to find a better demonstration of this than Sonic and the Fallen Star, a fan game from Stardrop. I don't know if this was Stardrop's intention, but Sonic and the Fallen Star is a perfect demonstration of how to evolve the classic Sonic formula going forward, what Sega should be doing if they want to make classic Sonic a core component of the franchise. Everything fans love about the classic Sonic is still here. The 2D side-scrolling gameplay, the pixel art graphics, that sense of speed and momentum, the spin dash is back, drop dash is back, Super Peel Out is back. Act 1 and 2 structure, it's all here. That classic Sonic structure is all here and it's all done perfectly. This game feels like if Sega made that Sonic Mania sequel, but got a passionate new creative team on board and just took it in a brand new direction for this game. Now, I'm not saying that every single successive game should feel like this one either, but this feels like a true to form yet out of the box entry to the classic Sonic saga. And all of these changes feel meaningful. For starters, the aesthetic. Aesthetically speaking, this is unlike any Sonic game we've ever had before. All of those patterns and art deco look that you love about the classic Sonic games has been teamed with a more animated look, with some really unique and diverse color palettes. I'd say everything's got a much more pastel colored look, but even that I feel like would be underselling it. It's a bit more complex than that. There's a very sort of 90s pop art vibe to this one. This feels like a classic Sonic alternative to the kind of 2000s grunge that we had with the Sonic Adventure series. And it's just bursting with character. Sonic and Tails' character sprites are arguably the most expressive that I've ever seen them in sprite form. Just little details like this here, when Robotnik's train passes Sonic, it pushes all his quills forward with the wind, and then he looks at the camera looking a bit cheesed off. Tails cheekily gesturing towards Sonic when he sees Amy on the billboard. So many new animations that give so much new depth to these characters have been implemented here. And it helps that these cutscenes, yes, they're still sprite graphics, but they manage to feel cinematic as well, thanks to some changes of camera angles too. And the level designs are just full of little easter eggs as well. I love that none of these levels are just one thing either. They feel more meaningful. This doesn't just feel like Sonic is running from place to place to place. This feels like one cohesive world, in a way that would make even Sonic 3 and Knuckles' sense of world building blush. I think my favorite level here is Discount District Zone. A shopping center in Sonic's world. How unique, but it's not just a backdrop as well. There's actual parts of the theming integrated into the level design. 
I know that should kind of be a given, but it's something that not even the mainline Sonic games have succeeded with entirely. With badniks that are literally little shopping bags that shoot projectiles out at you. From a visual and mechanical standpoint, this is just so fresh. I even just love that the different elemental shields that you can get are in different shapes now. The music as well. Like, the trailer wasn't lying when it said that this game had a banging soundtrack. Yeah, the soundtrack absolutely slaps. Again, it doesn't feel like any existing Sonic music. It has a very different texture to it, which matches that sort of 90s pop art feel perfectly. At the same time, it still feels like Sonic music. It's still catchy, it's still melodic, it's still energetic, but it is like nothing we've ever had before. And just like everything else in this game, it's still Sonic. It's just a Sonic that we've never experienced before. It takes a lot of talent to recapture the magic of classic Sonic, but it takes a lot of talent and a lot of vision to evolve that into something that is just as good, into something that feels like a welcome departure. And just across the board, Sonic and the Fallen Star does just that. And yeah, the soundtrack by Holly Taylor is just fantastic. It completely fits in with the rest of the philosophy of this fan game. In terms of the overall design of this game as well, and I mean like mechanically speaking, it is just awe-inspiring. Like, these level designs are a lot of fun. Something that kind of caught me off guard a little bit is there's often occasions where you have to move left of the screen in order to get to the right. So, like, the goalpost is always to the right of you. But sometimes you have to go left in order to go right. It makes these level designs quite unpredictable, but at the same time, this doesn't feel like just BS platforming for the sake of it. There's still an immaculate sense of speed and thrill, particularly if you take the upper paths. There were times when I was just breezing through these and I just felt like a ninja, as Sonic would just fly through these levels, blitz and bad nicks left and right. And as well as that, there are also some really unique level gimmicks as well, including mud that you have to kind of crawl under and around and sometimes just have to avoid sinking altogether. Little raspberry plants that shoot you upwards and you can use their leaves as like a glider. And very rarely does it feel like this is slowing down the momentum of the game. There was one section of level design that I didn't like at all, and that was in the second act of Frozen Fountain Zone. And I do believe that it can be avoided if you just keep to the upper path, but if you do accidentally stumble upon the lower path, there's no way of getting back up to it. There's just this section with these conveyor belts and these ice blocks, and you have to kind of platform onto the ice blocks or under the ice blocks, and just the hit detection here isn't great. I found myself dying a few times for just BS reasons. Like, times when I was just under the block but wasn't crushed by it, I'd find that it registered it as a crushing. And yeah, to summarize, this part was just a bit of a pain in the ass. That was the only instance of level design that I didn't like in this entire game. That is impressive. Then there are the boss fights. There's the mini bosses and the major bosses. And yeah, overall, they're really fair. Like, they are difficult. You have to get their attack patterns down, but they're absolutely fair. And you've got lots of opportunities to just wail on them, which I really like. When the boss comes in and that title card just comes up going, mess them up, it means it. And you get plenty of opportunities to just mess these guys up. I love it. They actually feel like proper fights more so than just mechanical bosses that you're up against. Their attack patterns are intricate and like even down to like the water boss fight, they take you down to different levels of the, well, level. The scenery changes a lot, meaning that these bosses constantly feel like they're refreshing themselves, which is really impressive. Right, little spoiler territory here. There is, of course, the matter of the final boss. I think difficulty throughout this game is actually really solid, even down to the final level, which, yeah, it ramps up the challenge, but it still keeps the thrill factor at the forefront. The final boss, like the other bosses, it, yeah, it feels like a fight, and it feels really good, Except, th there's just, there's a lot to this boss that makes me go, you maybe think that was a little bit much. Now you do have rings for this final boss, but there's a lot of attacks this boss does where it, it just, it might as well kill you. You might as well have not had the rings and just have the shield. You do not want to let this boss get you, because not only will it grab you and take your rings, it will throw you onto the opposite end of the screen to your rings. You can probably collect some of them if you're lucky. But I don't know, I think throwing you to the complete other end of the room is maybe just a bit of a cheap shot. At the same time though, it, it is a challenge. 
It just feels like a massive difficulty spike, though. But again, if you're going to have a difficulty spike, the final boss is where to do it. So I respect it. There are also special stages, too, where, man, they really popped off on the soundtrack here. Ah, this is amazing. These are like a variation of the Get Blue Sphere kind of deal, combined with a bit of the Mania style as well, where getting the Blue Spheres increases your speed. They're well telegraphed, easy to control, and, again, fair. Sonic is also not the only playable character here either. You can also play as Tails, who loses the Super Peel Out and Drop Dash in favor of being able to fly, reaching places that I'm not sure Sonic can even reach. Also, really nice touch giving Tails blue shoes. He was originally intended to have them, but I think there was some kind of color thing with the original Sega Mega Drive, which meant that if Tails' shoes were blue, when Super Sonic would go, you know, bright yellow, Tails' shoes would also glow yellow. Game design, right? That said, moving into the 21st century though, I'm not sure why Tails couldn't have blue shoes, because they really suit him. In terms of storyline as well, they keep things simple. They're looking for shards of a fallen star, so is Dr. Robotnik, and yeah, it's a race against the clock to collect them. So, Sonic and the Fallen Star feels like the next logical step forward for classic Sonic. No, this isn't as big as the epic that is Sonic 3 and Knuckles. However, it kind of evades comparison because it's such a step in a different direction. It kind of doesn't need to be because it's a much more charming sort of experience. It's a classic Sonic game with goals and aspirations of its own, and I really, really respect that. That is so refreshing. Listen, I, I I don't want to just slam another project so that I can elevate this one. But Sega, you really do need to take a look at this and see how you can evolve Classic Sonic going forward. It's not enough to just release compilations or, or greatest hits. Classic Sonic deserves a new repertoire. The kids of today that are growing up on these Classic Sonic games deserve Classic Sonic games of their own. And Sonic and the Fallen Star demonstrates just how bravely that can be done without alienating those that love this formula of gameplay. Overall, my hat is off to the team that worked on this. I think I read in NME magazine that Stardrop was the sole developer of this, that most of the work was done by that one person, aside from some help on sprite work here and there, and of course, Holly Taylor's contribution of the music, which is just fantastic. Honestly, this is a Sonic game like none you'd ever receive from the official production house that is Sega, because this is clearly the brainchild of a creative vision, and it's the kind of creativity that I guess they don't allow at Sega. They tend to keep things a bit more inside the box. But if this ever were an official release, I, I think like Sega would have an award winner on their hands here, because it is so, 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 so refreshing. Folks, have you played Sonic and the Fallen Star? What do you guys think? Comment below and let's discuss. And if you haven't already and you want a new classic Sonic game to play or you felt a bit let down by Sonic Origins, this is the perfect antidote for that. So be sure to check it out. So what do you guys think? If you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to hit that big, beautiful subscribe button. And of course, in the description below are links to different social media feeds, including the Patreon. If you're feeling extra generous, like the following people. Who are Marcus Ward, Sirius the Skeptic, Biotinarts, Mr. SP, David 20 Covers, Sergio, Shodin, Legendary Ray Ray, Adam Myers. Thank you guys, you are the best of the best. But as for the rest of you, thank you so much for watching, guys, and have a great day. Fuck you.